So I'm very happy to be able to talk to you about um, vermicomposting. I think you'll be surprised by how extensive it is throughout the world. So I'm very happy to share that with you. I'm, uh, as you can see, I'm in the horticultural science department at North Carolina State University in the United States. And I've been there for 28 years. And you can see my um, website address at the bottom. And I have tons of information there. I have videos and publications and podcasts and it will keep you busy for two days if you go to that website. So uh, check it out. All right, so um, people in 118 countries have contacted me just about vermicomposting. So that tells you how extensive it is. People on every continent except for Antarctica, go figure. So, um, so I was asked to write a book and my book is called The Worm Farmer's Handbook, Mid to Large Scale Vermicomposting for Farms, Businesses, Municipalities, Schools and Institutions. There are other fine books on small scale vermicomposting, but there wasn't really something on larger scale. So, um, so Chelsea Green Publishing um, published this. It's available from them or um, you know any bookseller you can find. But in it, this is this is kind of a list of topics that I cover in the book. They're not in order, but I do talk about. <coughs> excuse me, how vermicompost or vermicast, how it benefits soils and plants, and how you would choose a production system. You got a little taste of that with the last two. You saw, you know, Mick does it one way, and then um, Anna has different types of production systems going on, and she's been to different countries to check out how they're doing it. Um, so there's a variety of ways to do vermicomposting. And then how to find and manage feedstocks, um, lots of choices there. How to monitor your worm bed. And then how to harvest and screen and test and package and store vermicast. And then markets for earthworms and vermicast. So any of you who are thinking about doing this either at you know, at a business that you work at that produces a lot of organic materials or farms or schools or, you know, any institutions. Um, but if you're thinking about selling, you could sell earthworms and or vermicast. And then how to avoid common pitfalls, um, regulatory issues, super important to develop business and marketing plans. And then in the last chapter, I cover vermicomposting operations around the world. So you can, um, so I've got color pictures and, you know, for example, Anna had um, talked about the, the millionaire and he's uh, the very last one that I cover in my book. Um, I've held 20, well, I was supposed to hold my 21st annual vermiculture conference this month and it had to be canceled because of COVID. But Mark Purser, who um, Anna shared with us, um, he has spoken at my conference, I think 17 times. So <laughs> he's attended my conference that many times and he speaks. So anyway, um, where is vermicomposting taking place? So in businesses, like on site in businesses, you know, because think about it, people eat lunch um, and other meals on site or they're, um, you know, they're uh, uh, processing uh, fruit and vegetable waste. So, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, organics that are produced. And then schools and farms, community gardens, restaurants, grocery stores, they're examples of all of these doing it on site. And I talk about them in my book. Universities and colleges, and you saw a couple of uh, universities that Anna visited. Paper mills, military bases, think about all the food waste they produce in hospitals, prisons, and households. So it's taking place all over. 
Um, what will worms eat? So basically anything organic, you know, I didn't add like human manure that was covered by the last two speakers, but they'll eat comp finished compost or livestock manure, variety of livestock, you know, so um, Anna mentioned cows and, um, but pigs and goats and, um, you know, rabbits, all sorts of animals. Uh, vegetative food residuals, spoiled grain, coffee grounds, brewery waste, yard debris, cardboard, scrap paper, agricultural crop residues. So just a variety of things that they'll consume. So in the United States, if you manufacture compost, so compost is different from vermicompost. It's a totally separate process. But if you sell, if you try to sell your compost, the most you'll get for it is $30 per cubic yard. And in, if you sell the same amount of vermicompost, it'll sell for anywhere between $200 to $1,000. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and it's because it, it has a greater impact on plants than compost does. So what does it have? Um, so one thing is fully stabilized. Like if you do thermophilic composting, it has to have a few months to cure and stabilize. But with vermicomposting, the worms are eating it. And so it's, it's passing through an animal and coming out the other end. So it's fully stabilized. It means that it's also has a very fine particulate structure because have you seen a worm? It's really small. <laughs> and so, um, and inside the worms, it transforms nutrients like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and on and on and on. But it, it transforms them into forms that are readily taken up by plants. So it's really, you know, it's great. Um, it's more microbially active than what they consumed. So worms are kind of like microbe factories. So whatever they're taking in, whatever comes out the other end has even more microorganisms. So greater numbers, greater varieties. It has high water holding capacity. It, it um, transforms the organic material so that it's, the pH will be near neutral. And then this bottom part, the humic acids, fulvic acids, and plant growth hormones, those are the key to making such a huge impact on plants when you use vermicompost. So, if you mix in vermicompost into soil, you'll see uh, the seeds will germinate more quickly. The plants will go, grow bigger and stronger and have better developed root systems. And then they'll have greater yields of whatever it is that that plant produces, whether it's, you know, flowers or fruit or vegetables, you'll just have more because of vermicompost. Um, and so because it has better root development, it tolerates stress more. And so there's less transplant shock. And another really cool thing is that vermicompost, and there are thousands of studies about this, that vermicompost can reduce the um, parasitic nematodes and plant diseases and insect pests. It actually repels all of that. So, this is a study that um, I did with some colleagues um, many, many years ago, but they were, there were randomized plots outdoors in three different fields, three different seasons, but we planted turnips. And so what you're seeing on the left is a regular turnip, okay? And we made sure that everyone, so all three turnips that you're looking at, all of them have equal amounts of nitrogen. Does that surprise you? <laughs> Wouldn't you think that the bigger turnips have more nitrogen? But no, we made sure that all of the plants had equal amounts of nitrogen. The only difference is that the turnip on the left, which is a regular sized turnip, it had zero vermicompost. 
So the turnip in the middle had 10% by volume vermicompost. So that means, you know, if you had 10 cups of soil, you would replace, you'd remove one cup of soil and replace it with vermicompost. And look what it did to that turnip. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know, look at the root system and then the turnip itself and then turnip greens, you know, I mean, it's just phenomenal. And then the one on the right is only 20% by volume vermicompost. Pssh, look how big that thing is. So um, just a little bit of vermicompost goes a really long way. Um, so I want to, I don't have a lot of time to speak, so I want to show you um, some different systems. And so um, Anna had shared with us um, Mark Purser, the millionaire's um, windrows. And this is a shot of a different windrow. This is in Texas. But, um, you know, if you look at the bottom right of this picture, um, it, it's hard to tell the scale, but you know, these are rows that are three meters high, okay? And that's thermophilic composting. And you can see that there's, there's steam rising because the whole idea of regular composting is you want the temperatures to rise, but you don't want that to happen with vermicomposting. So it needs to be a shallow system. So you can see in the top left photo that people are standing over a worm windrow and it's less than a meter high, okay? And that's as deep as you would want it to get. So um, another system is, it's called the wedge system. So this is at Arizona Worm Farm. Um, in Arizona, all winter, or I'm sorry, all summer long, the temperatures were like over 110 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> but he's able to successfully manage um, doing thermophilic composting, but this is worm composting inside a, a shade cloth so, system. All right, so the next is, um, this is outdoors. It's best if you can have um, vermicomposting systems in the shade. So in the shade or under shade cloth, um, and so this again shows how shallow these systems need to be. So this is someone who was uh, feeding horse manure to worms and he just built these bins himself out of wood and um, put a reflective top on each of these. So that worked out, you know, very low scale. This is really cool. This is in Chile um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a horizontal worm composting system. So a lot of material can be processed in here. And so he's, um, the man is holding up one section of this. And so you would start vermicomposting there and the worm poop will always end up on the bottom, okay? And so, you know, it'll get, it'll get deeper and deeper into that bed. And when it reaches the point that you know, you're like, yeah, this needs to be harvested, you would start feeding in the next section and the worms would move over to that section. So this is like a raceway, you know, only very slow speed, <laughs> but the worms will harvest themselves by moving to each section. So, um, and this is in Kabul, Afghanistan. As you can imagine, you know, it's a very poor country. They don't have access to a lot of, you know, a lot of high tech materials. This is the only woman owned vermicomposting operation. I highlighted this, describing it in detail in my book, but they're using concrete blocks. And we saw some of that in Cuba as well, right? But this, this is a common material that's used around the world for vermicomposting. Um, another way is to do trenches. So these trenches are in what we call in the United States a pole barn. I don't know if you call it that, but you know you can you get the gist of it. That you know there's a there's a, a roof and the ends of of this barn do have doors that could close in the winter time. And then on the sides, the upper sides, 
they can help allow air to circulate. It gets quite hot here in North Carolina. So anyway, they dug trenches that are only 21 inches deep because again, vermicomposting is a shallow system. So what you're looking at directly, the light color that you're looking at, you know, so you can see dark, light, dark, light. Well, the dark parts, those are the actual trenches of this um, vermicomposting operation. The light part is um, like packed dirt and gravel where a, um, a tractor can straddle the dark trench. And so, so that's where the wheels would go, where the light color is. And a tractor with a manure spreader would drive over that trench and they have the manure spreader cal um, calibrated that only about an inch of, of raw hog manure is dropped into that bed. So 200 feet long by four feet wide. I'm sorry, that's right, I'm talking to the UK. So sorry, <laughs> it's not in meters, but um, <laughs> you can kind of get the gist of it. So. Um, and then uh, going to in more indoor systems. So this is in an area of the United States where, where it, they get really cold winters and they wanted to do um, municipal vermicomposting. And so they were picking up food waste from a variety of, of places that, you know, like restaurants and um, schools and you know, and bringing them to this site inside a greenhouse where they could help to control the temperature. And again, you can see they need to be very shallow beds. So they actually worked out a stacking system so they could take advantage of the, the vertical space. And then here's another operation. They actually, um, they uh, process paper. And so they have a lot of paper shavings left over. And so in part of their warehouse, they just built these simple um, wooden bins and, uh, and then, you know, filled them with worms and did vermicomposting. Um, this is in the basement of a restaurant. So a very big popular restaurant. They produce a lot of food waste and they use, um, they have like a different menu every day. So they, um, so at night they shred the menus and then they uh, pre-compost the food waste and paper waste together in the alley in enclosed systems. And then they come down to the basement there. And um, so they have a very, they've had a long time, very successful operation and um, and they capitalized on it because when you go to that popular restaurant and bar, you can also buy some worms, you can buy some vermicompost, you can buy t-shirts and hats and you know all sorts of things. So um, people really like that. Okay, um, and this is, this is really large scale vermicomposting, as you can see. So this is an indoor facility where they're controlling the temperatures year round. And they have these huge bins that are like at least 200 feet long. And um, so a lot of material can be processed. And this is taking place around the world. There's a huge operation like this in Belgium and in Mexico and here in the United States and, you know, just all over the place. But, um, and this is kind of all the rage because um, you can very efficiently produce a lot of vermicompost using this system. So, um, and this is what it looks like <coughs> that the bottom of the system has these open um, grates and, <coughs> excuse me, and so the, the vermicompost gets harvested from the bottom of the grate. So I'm gonna move on, mention that um, I do, in addition to the book I talked about, um, I co-edited a scientific vermicomposting book. It's got 600 pages, um, 35 chapters with authors from 13 countries. So a lot of people, so you could look for vermiculture technology as well. So I'm gonna end right here. 
And um, so again, there's my contact information, my website, my book, and I'm going to stop there.